Welcome to Azure Machine Learning Lowercase s Service. This is actually part two of a series, and this one's focused on training models in Azure. And my name is Brian Kefke, and I'm drinking out of my Python mug because Python will be featured in this video. I'm a data and AI solutions enabler at Microsoft, and I focus actually now on developing data science training content for Microsoft Worldwide Learning. So this actually envelopes very closely to what I've been doing for sort of professional development content. But this is kind of more a little uh, loosey-goosey and more fun to just jump in and, and do it with a little bit less, uh, probably a little less structure, but hopefully something you find informative and useful. So where are we going to go in this? Well, we're going to stop by talking a little bit about understanding the machine learning service. Now, the first video does, I think, a, a pretty thorough and pretty long <laughs> description of the concepts involved in the Azure machine learning lowercase service. And I say the lowercase s because there can be confusion. And part of that is what I talked about in my video. Sometimes Microsoft tends to brand all these different things and call it Azure Machine Learning Services or the Azure Machine Learning Service and uppercase s. And what I've learned is online, when you see the lowercase s, it's specifically referring to this service. So it's almost a coded thing you might not know. So that's why I say the lowercase s. And you usually don't see the word the or the article the before it. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but go to my first video because it's a very uh, thorough explanation of the concepts involved. We're going to get into a demo uh, showing how to train a model using the Azure Machine Learning Service. And we'll talk a little bit more I'm going to talk about Azure Machine Learning Service and Boston Pizza. And you have to say it that way, Boston. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's from the, I'm from the area, but my accent is technically Rhode Island. And uh, a little bit of advice about learning this that I've kind of gotten my kind of sharing what I've done and how to get into learning this better. So when we look at the Azure Machine Learning Service, the really key thing to get around the idea here is that it's it's bringing it all together. It's a back-end service that's running in Azure that, it, that can really weave and integrate a lot of other pieces in Azure for you. And that's really the, the key thing about it. It's also what I like to think of as more of like a hub. So the hub is you know, the center of the wheel, say on your bicycle, and then you see all these spokes coming out from that uh, wheel but the core part of it is what the azure ml service is like that hub and other things can hang off of it so for instance recently a little over a month ago at build microsoft announced that there would be a gui front end now in preview which would overlay or basically lay on top of this service so the real power of the services is in this ability to do experiments create them save your model etc and deploy them and that's really what the service is doing. So kind of looking at this diagram, it's like the idea is prepare your data, use whatever IDE you want. I like Jupyter Notebooks. We're going to be using for this demo Azure Notebooks, which has a free version. And the nice thing about the free version is it does let you have private uh, projects and, and code so you don't have to share everything on the public side of things. So that, I kind of like that because it's a nice little extra. You can train and test your models either on your own machine or Ideally, I think using Azure resources because that's kind of one of the ideas, right? You can get more compute, use GPUs, etc. And then the idea is it's not just providing the service to train and use models. It's providing a whole tracking and monitoring system. So the idea is you can register your model and now it knows it has a version. You can deploy that model and then they register and you create a, an image, basically a Docker image, which can then be used to uh, create containers that will run it, etc. So the Azure Machine Learning Service, now the GUI, if you don't want to do any coding, you can just do all of these great things using a GUI. Now, a key thing about that GUI is that that is, is similar to the Azure Machine Learning Studio, but the Studio does not rest on top of the service, which means it has less scalability and some other features. Power BI and Dynamics are also things that are resting on top of, when they do this machine learning stuff, they're resting on top of the AML service. So it, it's really important to get your head around, like this is really becoming very foundational to data science on Azure. And you can even do things like uh, deploy models to the IoT Edge. So if you have Edge devices and you want to be able to do uh, deploy your models there for scoring data, which might be good because maybe you want to do something like from an iPhone app or from some device that needs to be detached. And you can deploy your models. Maybe when there's a connectivity period, we can get to a network and download the, the freshest version, but then it can score on the edge. As I mentioned, it's uh, Jupyter Notebook. It's nice about if you use Azure Notebooks in particular, they come pre-configured with all the libraries and things you need. So a nice thing is you're actually running on a VM in Azure. It's giving you resources and you can do it free or you can attach to a VM, etc. We'll see a little more about that, but it's really nice. 
And if you're a Python developer, if you do your data science in Python, then you can completely integrate and leverage all of the wonderful services in the machine learning service at right through your code in Python. So I can't think of anything. Maybe there's some piece I'm missing, but I can't think of anything you can't do through the API, what they call the Azure Machine Learning Service SDKs. So there's a couple of different variations, but there's mainly a core SDK that does most everything you need to do. So you can sit right in your notebook or PyCharm or wherever you like to work VS Code and directly interface and create assets and things in Azure. Now you can also, a new feature which was uh, recently announced is you can create uh, Jupyter Notebook, Azure Notebook, v virtual machines right within the machine learning workspace. So that's a really nice feature as well because now you can kind of put it all together. And I like that you can select your scale. It's really nice when you create virtual machines, you can select scale. And you can turn things off. So you can set things like the VMs to turn off when you don't want to use them, etc. Okay, I kind of did that. So just wanted to highlight this before we get into a demo, but you can, when you do your training, you can use your local computer and it will still track things and you can do a lot of things leveraging the service. But then you can also go to the Azure Machine Learning Compute and that gives you a lot of flexibility, for instance, using like GPUs and all kinds of other things. So there's a, a lot of scalability, Kubernetes clusters or um, Azure Container and things like that. So you've got a lot of options there. You can also use re remote VMs. You can use uh, that you can see in here Databricks and Data Lake Analytics and HD Insights. There's a lot of extra pieces. I got the link below. Some of these I'm not sure how long they'll integrate with, like Data Lake Analytics and um, HD Insight. I don't know what the future plans is for that, but you can see in the pipeline support, you you get that. The pipeline idea is really sort of DevOps meets machine learning, and so it's also called MLOps, and that gives you a great deal of ability to, to really do end-to-end -end automation and tracking, et cetera. So let's jump in a little bit and take a look at what we're talking about. So first thing I want to do is just before I get into demoing the notebook, I want to walk through a little bit. So in order to create or to use Azure Machine Learning Service, you need to create a workspace. Workspace, and it's very common, Databricks the same way you call it a Databricks workspace. What I see it as really doing is two things. It's linking your subscription to a service that you want to sort of register with Azure to say, I'm going to be using this, so you know, connect it up, bill me, et cetera. So that's part of it. The other part of it is I see it as creating sort of a container to hold things. Um, resource groups are also containers, but this is sort of saying, I'm going to create the workspace container, which in this case I think is actually a subset of the resource group. So let me go in here, for instance, and I say, I want to do Azure Machine Learning. And you can see, as I'm just searching, creating a resource, Azure Machine Learning Workspace or Machine Learning Workspace. And you go in here and create. And so you can give it a name, you know, my Azure MLS, whatever. I'm not going to actually create this because I already have one. And then you can create a resource group. Now, if you're just playing around and stuff, I, I like to create separate resource groups for different services because then if I don't want it anymore, I know I can delete the resource group and everything will go away. Um, if you just try to do it through the workspace, not sure if any other pieces might dangle around, but, but the resource group is a pretty safe place to say, I want to delete everything later. It's also kind of a way to group things in general so you can track assets. And also, of course, you've got to pick what location you want. Fortunately, AMLS is pretty good about the coverage of where you can create these things. So uh, it's nice that no matter where you are in the world, you probably can take advantage of this. All right, so I'm going to jump out of that because I don't really need to do that. I'll go to my dashboard and I happen to have one here, the AMLS Workspace Demo. Yeah, I'll go in here for a minute. And a couple of things I want to show you. Like, so you get a lot of different assets here. Pay attention to this. There's lots of good documentation. As you can see something here I mentioned, the Azure Machine Learning Notebook VM Automated Machine Learning Model Service. So this kind of like, that's actually kind of like a a wizard that'll walk you through using automated machine learning, which means you can do things, for instance, like I don't know what model to use, so you can go through a step and say, this is what I want to do, and it will tell you what model you can use and set hyperparameters. You also have the visual interface, you got documentation. So take a look at this, because this will always be extended. And all really important, view samples on GitHub. If you're going to be doing Python coding with the SDK, etc., you want to start with notebooks that are written. It is uh, there's a lot to it, but if you start with notebooks that are written, it's already done all that, that sort of laying out the grid work for you, and you can jump in and, and just worry about your Python coding. So highly recommend doing that. Find something similar. Later on, I'm going to kind of talk about, like, I like the idea of 
create some templates and then just cut out you know what you do, you know what's replaceable like here's my python training script i'll show you that later leave everything else around it and then you can just kind of tweak your compute etc but by having sort of a shell really like the old days you have like the skeleton program you never write from scratch you pull out your skeleton program and then you start adding code to it but you don't have to do all the, the all sort of groundwork all right so we can go in here and you can see on the side we have automated machine learning notebook vms so we can go in there and create that and just as a quick demo we can go to the visual interface which is really cool to give you an example though if you look at the way the it looks a lot like aml studio a little less stuff going on i guess i'd say but just an example this is one thing I, you can create out of the box is this this is a model that you can kind of start with it's kind of gives you like a demo to take a look at and the main thing i just show you at this point i, I plan to do some uh, future videos to dig down more into this but if you've used aml studio before then you have a pretty good idea of what's going on here you drag and drop things you have all these properties you can set if i want to you can have saved data sets um, you can also have my data set so i've uploaded this one and i can just drag it over and if i want to use it um, delete it and you kind of drag you, you connect things you say i'm going to connect one thing to another so i can connect this i can't do that one but i would connect one thing to another and that's really the idea behind this and when i'm done i can save it i can say run and I can even go through and now deploy it to a web service as a web service. So that's the, the beauty of it. So the one takeaway I just wanted to highlight there is you now have a really great non-programming front end to be able to do scalable machine learning. So that's that's the selling point there. And I'm going to jump off because that's not really the focal point, but I didn't want to lose that. All right. So the other thing I want to kind of touch on is I show you that diagram and maybe it's not clicking just how re basic that diagram is that I showed you earlier. You really do have these things experiments and you'll see in there i think i may have one i yeah uh so i have a couple of experiments in here i have pipelines you can have compute so if you go to compute compute is actually i need physical machines to run this so i have this you know cpu cluster and it has a definition in here of what i'm using and how much etc so that's what you tell it how many cpus do you want how big a machine how much memory and stuff and you have all these options these are registered models. So if I have a model that I've actually registered to the service, you can see I have this thing called my model. I can have versions. Uh, I can go into things so and look at them in more detail, images, etc. I don't have any uh, deployment images yet. The, the images part is where you say, I'm really ready now to take this and I want to make it something that can serve applications. The beauty of it is you can do it with like mouse clicks or you can use Python code. And when it's deployed, the image is like everything you need. What are the Python libraries you need? What kind of VMs do you want? What kind of resources do you want? At the end, it will give you a nice REST API call that's really simple to use, and any application can now just call it. Really nice use case because a lot of times you develop these models, and the challenge becomes, well, how do I deploy this so applications can use it? And the data scientist is not typically a developer that's skilled in doing that. So this is very empowering for data scientists because they can now do end-to-end -end with this service. So you've got your deployments and activities and there's all kinds of good stuff in here so i'm going to do more videos getting more into it uh but takeaway really here is it's meant to be a end-to-end -end data science full pipeline service and you can pick and choose what you want you can say i just want to train a model i just want to use auto ml to tell me what model i should be using and then i'm going to go off on my own and do other things i maybe i don't want to use any of this except that nice piece at the end where it deploys it to a container cluster and i can now tell my apps use this rest api and i didn't have to do anything like that you know, it's kind of like some of those old commercials where someone's baking, they use an instant cake recipe, but then they throw some flour in their face and look like they sweat all night, you know, hours in the kitchen to make it. And they say, no, it's just, you know, they don't tell anyone that really it was easy. Uh, this stuff is very much like that. You can do this great stuff. And as a data scientist, people are going to be like, how did you do this end to end? And you don't have to tell anyone, right? I will tell them, but, you know, you can make it look like you're just a miracle worker, like Scotty on the Enterprise, right? But so that's really the, the idea here. So let me get into the notebooks itself so i've logged into already to save a little bit of time to the azure notebooks and you can just go in find azure notebooks sign up for free honestly it's just a great service because if you you might have a really low-end machine right well this runs completely on the cloud so you don't have to have any kind of real computer as long as you have a browser you can go in and use this and you can access your notebooks from anywhere since it's all stored in the cloud and as i mentioned you can have it private you can see this this whole shutdown thing so when i go in i can create projects and i can shut things down i can upload files i can do a lot of different things but i'm going to go into this one notebook to kind of walk through what we're going to do now you can create you can connect to your own vms with the notebooks or you can create 
a notebook VM as I mentioned and showed you within the service and I do recommend that if you're going to get serious and into it because you'll have more control these notebooks uh, the notebook service is a bit slow it's great for learning not necessarily good for scale at least unless you you know again there's a point you'll have to pay I guess at that point if you want scalability so there's a link here I'm putting this notebook it's out available on my github account I'll put a link in there so you can get to that and you can get this notebook uh, but I want to step back and say what I want to do here is I want to train a machine learning model on Azure Compute. What that means is I need to take what I have, what I would normally be doing all local in my local little notebook, and I'm going to have to push it into Azure. And I'm going to make sure all the pieces to run and train that model are in Azure. Now, the benefit of this is I can set up a really powerful GPU-based virtual machine. I can set up a Kubernetes cluster for the training. I can set up Spark training. I can do all these different powerful things. I think you can do Spark there too, yeah. Um, but the point is, when I'm doing this, in this particular example, what I'm really doing is this. I'm tr I need to run the script on Azure. So this diagram is meant to show you, and by the way, in notebooks now, you can just paste, do a control V, and it will actually paste the image right into the notebook. And that's what I did here. But you can see that I've got this sort of virtual machine created. So you don't have to think about the fact that you're going to get a virtual machine, but you will. And when you have containers, you know, there's a lot of talk about Kubernetes and Azure Container Instance, etc. The the idea there really is that you're going to have a virtual machine, but instead of allocating an entire virtual machine for that one thing you want to run, you can actually have a, a, v, a VM have many containers within it. So it's just a little bit lighter weight. That's the idea. You don't have to keep instantiating a new copy of the operating system. So you see here the host OS. You've got that. You could have many. So I'm only showing one instance, but this could be a thousand or a hundred or whatever containers running potentially on a single machine and so that's the idea of it you can see we've got binaries and applications so that's our piece like what we need to run so our application in this case is our training script we want to push things up and say okay train a model here's my data and score it so what else are we going to need I mean, again we have to it's kind of weird it's like if you think about you're going to go away to uh we'll say you know maybe you do airbnb or you're staying somewhere when you get there, you say, oh, I have to have everything I would normally have for my routine. So I have to have my toothpaste. I have to have my shaving kit. And if you forget things, you're kind of like out of luck, right? You can't do things. Similarly, when you create these containers in Azure, you need to give it the pieces it's going to need to run the app. Which means, after all that, I need to tell it what Python libraries am I going to use. In our case, we're going to use scikit-learn. Also, I want to do a little bit of data wrangling, so I'm going to have to bring in pandas. So this is typical in Python when you're creating things somewhere else to run. You create the dependencies file. It can be done through virtual environments, et cetera, if you've used those in Python. So in a similar way, you just tell it, these are the libraries I need. That will give you the scikit-learn so that when your training script calls in the scikit-learn classification model, it's there. You also have to give it the training script. Now, that's probably sitting on your local machine, or in our case, it's sitting on our Azure uh, notebook environment. We need to also push that into the Azure container, or at least make it available. And finally, we need to get the data to this uh, to be available for the training, right? Because we use data for training. And there's there's a number of ways we could use storage for that. But the easiest way we're going to use is Azure Blob Storage. So fortunately for us, we'll see that's almost transparent. It's really easy to do. We can just push it up with Python, and it will now be available. But that's the idea. So we need to give all the pieces for our training script to run, and then we can run it. Now, the good news is all of this can be done using the Python SDK. So the Azure Machine Learning Service SDK Python, SDKs will help us. So if we need to, you've seen online, I already have those service workspaces created. I have a couple out there and I'm going to use one that's already there. But if I didn't, uh, just, you know, looking at this, if I can maybe bring that up a bit, you can see that this is the most important SDK, the Azure ML.core. Now, it's important to realize that I'm on Python 3.6. So I have found that if I try to use the core on 3.5 or other versions, it doesn't work. So you do need to be up to the version. And again, because I'm on an Azure notebook, it's already there. I don't have to worry about installing it and doing pip install or whatever, which is really nice or conda. Uh, and then this will actually go in and notice what it's doing. It's importing the workspace object and then it's creating a workspace. Now I have it, as I said, so I'm not going to create a brand new workspace, but this could be done if I need to create a workspace. When you see this, you're going to have from above, you're going to have a workspace name. You have a subscription ID it's connected to. Resource group, which is like a box or container that's going to hold all the assets related to this. And location. 
So let's kind of step back here. Now we could also, as I showed you previously, we can just create a workspace in the portal and that's fine. We can use ARM templates. So we have, we have a bunch of options. Here's a link here that you can use from this notebook that points to all the different ways we can do things. What I'm gonna do instead is just do a get the workspace. So I'm gonna get a reference to the workspace and I can do that by just using workspace.get and give it the basic properties I need. Now I didn't wanna expose my subscription ID just because it's probably less secure than it needs to be if you do that. It's also kind of neat that you, if you haven't seen this, you can actually run one notebook from another. So this notebook is actually going to establish this my subscription ID variable. And then I can just run that code. So let me run that. Oh, and I should probably, uh, nope, not gonna run that. Okay. And now that that subscription ID exists, with any luck, I can run this. That might take a minute. Okay, now this is really important. I, I get this link. Remember, we're running in a notebook, but that notebook doesn't know anything about Azure Machine Learning Service yet. Yes, it has libraries, but it hasn't established a connection to our subscription, to a service, etc. So when I try to do this get thing and connect, it's and it, it's going to pr print out this stuff, but it's going to give me a link. It automatically knows, oh, you're trying to connect to Azure. Here's a link. By the way, when you get to that link, for security reasons, use that code. So I'm going to click on this. Fortunately, it opens up in a new window, and I paste in that code, get rid of the extra space I got, say next, and it's gonna say what, I have a bunch of different accounts, I use my Microsoft one, and it's basically saying you have signed in, right? So it tells us you have now signed in, which means I now have created a connection between my notebook and the Azure ML workspace, which is critical to get any further. Notice now, I have this print statement telling me uh, that it did it so it says you've completely did this successfully right interactive authentication and i just put some things around it like what's the name of the workspace i'm using etc so the name of the workspace is the amll workspace demo it's in the eastern us etc etc um, a lot of times when i'm doing things i run the print statements around really good practice i find when you're doing this especially with when you're working with cloud resources always make sure there's some sort of a print statement output statement at the end that way, if it's running, you're not wondering, is it doing something or not? Because you know it has to hit that print statement and output something. And sometimes things can take a little while when you're doing like training, etc. So tip number one. So there's a lot of notes about what we're doing, but we're trying it. What we need to do is set up that environment. I remember all that stuff we talked about what we're gonna do. We need to set things up for that. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is, before I get into the actual building environment, I'm gonna just kind of do a baseline and make sure all the pieces are in place. So one of the things I'm gonna do here is, I've already really had this. I should be all set for that, but I'm gonna import NumPy and Matplotlib and just make sure all the pieces I need are available. And one of the things you can do is if I wanna save, and I'm not gonna get into like loading and all this stuff, but that could be a great future video, but when I have a configuration set up to connect to Azure, I can also just do this write config and then I can do uh, load that in later to connect. But let me get past this. So one of the things I want to do is um, is take a look here, and you'll see that I actually, you know, what do I have uh, data available, et cetera. So you can see I have this AMLS demo subfolder, and I stored a few things in. That's actually where my set virus notebook is, and we'll see also I have a data folder where we're going to put the data to be used in this training. Okay. So the next thing I need to do, I need an experiment in Azure. Now I have two. I'm going to create a third instead. So I'll create a third experiment, AMLS demo experiment. An experiment, the way I look at an experiment is, I see it as a container within a container. So we've got the Azure Machine Learning Workspace. We're gonna have many potentially different projects, right? We're doing, maybe we're doing um, patient readmission in a hospital. Another one, maybe we're doing claims payments and trying to predict payments or whatever we're doing. Another one could be image recognition. So the idea is to kind of set, create separate experiments as a way to organize our projects and experiments. So that's what's going on here. Again, we're pulling in the core and uh, then we're just gonna create the experiment. Now, if it doesn't exist, it creates it. If it exists, it'll just point to it. And uh, key thing is just note that we're creating an object reference here. So we're gonna be using that later. Fast, right? Good, all right, so we haven't really done too much yet. I think it's actually going to physically create things once we get beyond that. So here we can create or attach existing compute resources. In other words, we need some compute. So this cell, a lot of stuff going on, I recognize. Which is why I really recommend, you know, take, create template spreadsheets or at least skeleton ones you can cut and paste. That's what I do. There's a lot of pieces here. 
I can tweak things like how many nodes do I want in my cluster, which is basically how many containers. So I can go zero to four. Now in my situation, this is small. I don't think it's gonna need any more than one. You have this sort of names, which you can get from the portal and more details about that and also online documentation. But I'm taking standard D2, V2, data science, I believe is D2, V2. And then, then here it's just saying logic like, okay, wait, if I already have it out there, then just connect it. Otherwise I'll create it. Now in this case, it should exist, I believe. So let me, I'm gonna run this cell. Oops. Okay, and you can see it says, oh, I found the compute and I'm just gonna use it. And that's because I had this code to do that. Great. Now, I like to do a little sanity checking as I go along. I don't wanna go through all this work and find out, oh yeah, I never uploaded my data file I'm gonna use for model training. So this is just code that is had nothing to do with training in Azure, but just to sanity check pieces of there. I'm gonna, I'm using this birth weight. The, the model I'm trying to do is to predict low birth weights in children based on some data. And I'll take a look at the data. I'm not gonna get heavily into it. I've done some other videos, probably should explain a little more, but it has metrics like uh, mother's blood pressure, mother's age, race, uh, kind of different metrics and demographics. And the idea is using historical data uh, to, to see what causes low birth weights. Can we predict the likelihood of low birth weights? So I'm gonna import pandas and just do a little checking of my data. Typically what you would do in a case like this is exploratory data analysis, et cetera. I'm not gonna really get into that. That's something you can do and recommend it obviously, but I'm just kind of jumping to the, the use of Azure. So we can see in the data set, this zero all the way down, this just happens in this, this few statements. We have um, a low, these are not low birth weights. If we had a one, there it is. You can see the, the mother's age. Um, I, there's race, I can't remember what LWT is. I think it's the, the weight, the person's weight. Uh, you have other things here. One is to if they've had past uterine uh, uterine infections or urinary tract infections, excuse me. Uh, FTV, birth weight. Now, when we actually train the model, we have to get rid of birth weight because that's a direct correlation to the whether it's low or not. And of course, we have to tell it to strip out what we're trying to predict, which is low. So we'll separate that out. So what we're going to do here is we're, and then again, I'm not doing this now at scale. I'm just sanity checking things. So I'm going to pull the model again, read it in again. And this time I'm really just want to get that low high thing so I can take a look at it because I'm going to be pulling that into another variable, which is my Y side of it, which would be for training. And I've got that. Great. Okay. So kind of let's step through. We're starting to get ready. Things are there. And now I know my data is there. It looks pretty good. Um, I'm going to step through this a little bit. And here what I want to do is I need to make sure my data, which is out here in uh, uploaded. I've already uploaded it just to show you here I have a data folder and this low birth weight CSV file and that's what I'm going to be doing here so I'm pulling in URL live request this it's, this is all standard Python really at this point and let's just run that it's I think it's easier to see it so what I'm doing is I'm creating a data folder I'm getting my current default which is where my notebook is but then I want to append a subfolder and so this is where the data is currently bear in mind it can't stay there when I'm training on Azure. So I'm gonna to have to do something. Now we have this thing called the data store and it's connected to my workspace. So the WS we created earlier and I can say, get me the default data store and show it to me. And so I see I've got some blob storage, etc. And here I can actually, now that I have that, I say, okay, I've got a data store and I have the data I need. What I need to now do is, is upload it. So I'm gonna take that data folder we created above, which is this. And I'm telling it that's a source folder. My target is AMLS demo. Okay, so the target path. AMLS demo is just creating like a logical subfolder, a namespace within the blob storage, so I can name it later. If it's there, I'm telling it to overwrite it. And this tells me to give it some progress. So this this is part of the SDK sort of functionality. And it's kind of cool because what it's actually doing is it's just uploaded that file into a, a blob storage for me, ready to go for my model training. Now, I like to just show this because this is kind of separate, but by running this cell, what it's showing me is what are the available compute. So I have blob storage, that's what we're using. I can also do Azure file. And uh, you can see here, it shows that I've uploaded to that. So it's kind of cool. There are other things you can do. You can create completely separate storage. You could have your own blob. You could have data like whatever you want. But this point is to get to 
just a quick and quick way to upload things and get started with your machine learning training. All right, so before I run this script, my training on Azure, I'm going to do a sanity check locally. So I'm going to run my script here. I'm bringing in the libraries I need. Um, I've got my file path, so I'm saying this is how I'm going to get to the data. I'm going to be doing the re running of this. I'm telling it the maximum depth of the model. That's one of the hyperparameters. So that's going to go in here, and I'm going to set it this way. Um, and you'll see why that's going to be going to be used a bit later. And then I'm just doing a very raw calculation to say how good is this predicting. To be honest, it's not a good model because it's too good. Uh, it's like 100%, which isn't good. Uh, overtraining, overfitting, I know. But the idea here is just to give you an idea of like how would I actually run this. And you can see it says, okay, running the test, data scored. Oh, actually, it's 98%, so maybe it's better than I thought. And if I run these pieces, I just want to show you that up here I'm doing like a test. So I'm taking my test data and doing a scoring, comparing it to the actual values. And you can see it just kind of shows me, okay, I've got this. And I've got this, so, you know, it looks good. So all this up to now, we've done a little bit. We've got our data up there. So remember the sort of pictures. We need to get our data there which part of it we need to make sure it knows about our dependencies for modules in Python and we need to make sure we get the script there. So let's the next step is going to be putting our script up into Azure. So that means very much like the data we actually have to say here's the script and push it into Azure. So we're going to import the OS. This is standard Python. Nothing fancy, nothing up our sleeves here. Run that and then I'm just going to run this to say there it is. So nothing fancy. We're just saying this is where we're going to put our script file. This is a training.py file. We could call it whatever we want, but we need to make sure we tell it the right name later. And so now we're going to have, this is the more or less the same script here. We're going to be running here. So we've got, so that's why at the top here, remember this, the value of script folder, okay, is right here, right? So it's going to be reading, it's going to write to this folder. And this is just to save the script. So what we're actually doing is we're saying, take the output, this entire script here, the output of this cell, write it to that script folder and call it train.py. This is so we can then push it into Azure for the, for the actual training, right? So what I do is I, I mark this off carefully to say there's a lot of stuff here that's specific to Azure Machine Learning Service. Um, one of the things is we may want to pass parameters to the script. In order to do that, we, we kind of, Azure is going to sort of put a function around it. We don't have to worry about it, but we may want to pass things into it. And we do that with these, this add argument feature, which means we can define what do we want to be able to dynamically modify on the training when it runs. So part of it is pushing it into Azure. Part of it is also parametizing it the way we need to. And that's what these do. So this is not your standard Python code. It's part of the Azure ML service SDK code. We're also going to be doing is we're going to be setting up a data folder parameter and that's going to basically tell it where to get the data folder. So we can say, oh, yeah, you we have a default, but we want you to go over here for the data and the max depth. So this is what we want you to set for the max depth hyperparameter on the model. Um, and then we can say run. And this is really key. I made a mistake of not having this line. And basically the run get context connects you to the Azure ML service environment and, and can monitor things. Without that, you're kind of dead in the water. So I learned that the hard way. And uh, then we start in. And what I do here is mark this off. This is why I like templates. Your model code training code starts here. So it's model training code starts here. And then I go down and I say uh, the model training code ends here. So make it, mark it off. And then you've got, you know, this stuff, All right? So cool stuff. This is really the same script we looked at above. Okay, so what I would do is copy that cell, it's really what I did, and just paste it down here. This is, out of all this, this is the only code that matters from your machine learning standpoint. The rest is setting up the, the scaffolding and necessary pieces so Azure can take it over and run it. So nothing fancy here, we're saying we're gonna use these, just like before, we're gonna be saying use these libraries. We wanna do this training split thing, great. I'm gonna say filing path, OS path. So that's currently local, and we're gonna be saying this. However, that's going to change here because we're going to be getting um, the DS folder somewhere in here. We'll see that. The DS folder later you'll see is actually going to overlay it so it's where we uploaded the data. So I'll show you that later. But basically we're just going to read our file. 
So for us, this looks just like it did before. Nothing, nothing really different, right? It's pretty straightforward. Once it's run that script, these are some specific things we might want to do. So we can run.log allows us to write to the log file in the Azure ML service. So it'll be saved for posterity. It's something we can look at. We can go back to and say, oh, okay. Um, for instance, this is the data folder directory. This is this is my accuracy calculation, uh, which I s calculated here, right? So I'm getting my accuracy. And then here I can say, uh, I'm going to, now this line just basically is going to write out the resulting model to a pickle file. So standard Python, and why are we doing that? Because we want we need to create a physical asset. We need to store the resulting model somewhere because we want to be able to deploy it. And pickle is just a really flexible way to create a serialization of the model. All right, so that's the idea there. So let's let's run this, and we'll see that at the bottom we'll just see it says it wrote it out. So it says overwriting it. It was already there. I've been trying this out, so we got that great. Now the next thing we need to do is we're starting to get towards creating the the environment for it to run in Azure. So we create this thing called a, a train estimator. And notice we now have those parameters. And we have this thing DS path. DS path is where we created the data, data source earlier where we, we actually uploaded the file to. So it's pointing to the location in Azure where this data file is. So we're overriding that. When the script runs, it's not gonna try to read it locally anymore. It's gonna read it within the service. And we gave it this logical path name. And max depth is something I'm just hard coding a value. I could say 24, 10, whatever. So the max depth is a hyperparameter and I might like the flexibility to be able to tweak that hyperparameter. Now, once this is done, we, this is really just setting up a parameter, a, a, a parameter sort of a template. We're going to use that here. So it's, it's when we actually create the estimator, we're gonna say, here's where you should get the training script. Okay, we've already seen that, that's the local folder which means it will automatically push that up and run. Here's the script parameters, which is coming from here. So I could have any number of parameters I want to define. We've got two. Here's my compute target. We saw that before, zero to four, CPUs, et cetera. So I've defined a compute target. Here's my entry script. So this is the train.py we created. And then we've got, here's the dependency. So this is really key. I found, be careful here because like pandas is a dependency. It doesn't, it seems like NumPy, I guess because it's part of the base package, you don't actually have to specify that. But Pandas you do. And if you're using any other kind of libraries, if you're using any kind, probably not visualization since you're just training a model, but if you're using other types of machine learning libraries, just make sure you put them in there, all right? So I'm gonna run this. Hopefully I have all the previous things running. Uh, and again, I can now take a look at what it's in the EST, just to, you know, nothing really interesting to look at. And I just wanna say, okay, so this is where the script folder is. And for full clarification, if I go in here, you can see there's training.py, and it's just the training script, you know, Excel. So I just want to show that. Great. And now what we're going to do is run this, run and submit it. So we, a lot of pieces to keep track of here. It's a little weird because you're kind of trying to set up all the pieces for everything to be there. I need my toothbrush. I need my toothpaste. I need this. You need all these pieces to be moved into our new environment and then run. And if anything's not there, um, my experience, 90, so probably 99% of the time when I have issues, it's because I forgot to move a piece there. And it will tell you in the log, yeah, you know, I, I can't find Python. I can't, I'm just, I can't find pandas. I can't find something. So let's run this. And notice like I'm running this, but I don't see anything. That's why I get this print complete so I can see this. Takes a minute. Okay, it's not running yet. Sorry, I and I get confused all the time. I'm actually just returning a run object essentially. So I need to go a little further down. And what I need to do here is run it and it uses this widgets thing, which is actually pretty cool because it's gonna give me a nice visual tracking log to see what's going on. So we've actually created the, the object to submit, but we actually, we haven't run it yet. So, so now we will run it. And you notice this says queued and I can go into the ML workspace. And if I go into experiments, hopefully it will show up. You can see I have this experiment three. So it's actually just created that. And it's it's kind of going on. It shows this going and notice it says, I can drag that, queued. Sometimes it's weird. Uh, so it is a detached asynchronous kind of situation. Like any batch queue, if you've ever used SQL agent or any kind of job schedule, you queue it 
but you're waiting for resources. Um, I haven't figured out why it can take a while sometimes for, to get through the queuing. Other times it seems to run immediately, but it, it does do that. But eventually this will come back and it will go through queuing and we'll see messages coming here to, to run and show, show what it's seeing as it goes. It's a very rich log. Okay, we can see from this at this point the run is completed and we can get a we get a lot of messages here. So it's I, I, I never I always kind of ignore this and just said get to the bottom line, but I do find it really interesting to see all the steps and what it's doing. Now if I go into my workspace again, I can go into models and you can see now that pickle file is out here, it's registered. So I've got things like dates and things, and there's a lot of great things around this. So again, the key takeaway is this is a cataloging and storing everything. So I have a nice machine learning tracking environment in addition to everything else. I can see when did I do this model, when was it last scored, what trained, etc. It's great. And there's even tracking you can do around usage of the model and scoring, etc. So a lot of good stuff. Let me go back to here. That's mostly what I wanted to demonstrate here. We can go down down here and another way we can do this is we can say if we're running a notebook we can say wait for completion if we want to have additional steps process afterwards. So we just kind of watch that but we could do it that way as well. Uh, we can also do this uh, get metrics and we'll do that. Um, yeah, so we got that. We can see get file names etc. Not sure what that does at this point. Yeah it just shows a lunch, bunch of different stuff going on. And here we can then register the model. So we can we can say I'll register this as my instead of my model I'll just call it something else. But I can call this you know my uh, BW model and register that. That um, we're able to take all our pieces and move it into the environment and execute and train a model. So when we train and particularly train them, the deployment is a lot simpler because we don't have to worry about having you know, training data files, only pieces. The deployment's a little bit easier in some ways. This lays the groundwork, but the training, you have to make sure you've told it what Python libraries are you using. It could be TensorFlow, it could be whatever. Uh, you, want, you need to tell what compute. Do you want me to use GPUs for if maybe you're doing deep learning neural networks or whatever? You can do that. So you tell it what you need. How many containers do you want, etc. So those are the pieces. You've got to kind of, again, I like the kind of the analogy of moving into, you're in a hotel room for a week or whatever. You know, get your shaving kit, get all the things you're going to need, and of course, you know, if you're like me, you always forget something. Usually it's my shaver or toothpaste. But um, so don't forget your toothpaste. So I want to step back and I like simple things. So this this is uh, I, I have to take things in very basic terms. When I think of things like PaaS and IaaS and all these things, what are we really talking about? Nowhere is that more true than when we talk about the Azure Machine Learning Service because it's a true PaaS offering and it's has exponential in a way because behind the scenes not only is it giving you this exposed service similar to what Azure SQL DB would give you but it's giving you an orchestration of features in Azure behind the scenes so the complexity and sophistication of what's happening I think is really a lot higher than some of the other services at this point and I want to get my like so I have to get my head around things I like concrete examples of things so bear with me I don't mean to uh, you know make this too simple but I like it for me, so I try to. I want to convey it the way I understand it, and maybe that'll be helpful to you. So I like to order pizza and other things from this place near me, Boston Pizza. They actually have a huge array of foods, which is great because I get burritos some days, and other days it's like California wraps. Other days it's pizza, and it's really good. And sometimes, rarely do I do this because I tend to see them as more like call them up and things, or just place an order. But one of the things I could do is go into it as a restaurant, right? The front desk, the interfaces, you talk to the maitre d' or whatever, and they'll sit you down, the host, and uh, they'll sit you down somewhere, and then you get people to work with you. You know, what do you want? What are you looking for? And this sort of personal service is you get in there, and you ask what you want, and, in, and the service doesn't stop until you leave the restaurant. And the waiters and waitresses will bring your food orders to, say, a window, order up, you know, pick the tag down, and the idea is that you're going to get table service and this the underlying service you're really getting is food preparation, right? I want a pizza, I want a burger, I want a burrito. That's a kitchen service they're providing. But the interface to it is the table service. This is actual personal in, face, in place kitchen service, all right? That's one way to work with it. Another way is, the way I typically use them actually is to go online, place an order, and then they deliver it to me. 
So that delivery could be over the phone, could be using a computer, as you can see here. And I kind of think of that as like an API, right? It's the way I interface with them. But maybe I need to scale up. Maybe I have a hall. It's a wedding or something. I like pizza for my wedding. So I'm going to scale up. I'm going to have 200 people in a hall, and I want them to cater it. Well, that's a little different. I can go through many interfaces. I can go to the front desk. I could go online and call. But it's a different kind of thing as far as, you know, kind of a deployment side. Now I'm asking you to scale out. In all these cases, I'm providing kitchen services. But there's differences, nuances, and things that are specific to what my use case is, my needs at any point. And you get this thing. But the idea here is it's very much, much like a PaaS. It's, it's a platform as a service. In all cases, it's the kitchen services. It's that food preparation that is core. The other things are sort of wrapping around it, catering in particular. You know, maybe they give you even napkins. they got to send people there to set up, etc. But you're really getting that core service. So let's look at that and kind of map it to Azure Machine Learning Service. Here I see similar things, and this is just like touching on some highlights of what you get in the machine learning services. There's actually a lot more here, but one we just saw, for instance, was training a model. So we can train a model using Azure ML Service, and it will do kind of like the kitchen floor. They worry about pots and pans and, and how many things they need and what they do. And, and when you do it with Azure ML Service, it's going to worry about creating the containers and the hardware, et cetera, you need. Now, the overall box, I'm calling the Azure Machine Learning Service, much like sort of the workspace, but underneath the covers, you know, kind of mapping this to the kitchen services, you've got the Azure ML Service Services. And I say service services because there's an orchestration. It's highly extensible. Right now, this is what's available. Tomorrow, wouldn't surprise me, Microsoft says, hey, we're going to order, offer a new interface through some of one of our products, and it's going to let you do new things. It's going to be another one where you can just, you know, go through Katana and talk to it. It'll build machine learning models. I don't know what they'll do, uh, but... It's a very extensible architecture. And one of the things I like about it also is it's it's loosely coupled. In other words, I believe, I don't now I don't have inside info on this actually, but I gotta believe that this has some sort of a generalized API wrappering these services. And what that would mean to me, because Spark and other services are like that, and if that's true, which seems reasonable, then it makes it highly extensible, right? Because I could have a wrapper in other in many languages. I could say I need an R module. Boom, got an R module. I want this. Boom, I want to use C sharp. Plus, any software can also use that generalized API. So, kind of going through services, training a model. AutoML will let me say pick the model and tell me what's the best one to use. Deployment services and pipelines really let me do this sort of end-to-end -end automation. And that's a great example of where it's integrated with things like Azure Data Factory and, and DevOps and things services. So that's a really like value added where you're getting a lot of different Azure services and they're being orchestrated for you. So you don't have to. So when you look at this, the probably one of the most primary APIs, the things that you know, data science is heavily being done in Python and that is growing all the time. So one of the primary ways you can interact with the Azure ML service services is through the Python SDK as we've just seen, but that's only one way. We also saw that there's a GUI, a lot there. You can do end-to-end -end everything you can think of here, as most of it at least. I don't know all of it. I haven't gotten as heavily into the GUI, but you can do a lot of these things through the GUI. And there's always the chance for that to be extended as well because it is also using that sort of layer on top, the API. Of course, the portal let us do some things we saw sure about creating the service. So we've got that. And of course, we can also use ARM, you know, ARM templates, REST APIs, Azure CLI, et cetera. So there's all those pieces. And I mentioned things like, you know, products like Power BI and things like that and, and Dynamics, and they can also build on top of the service and leverage it. So when I look at this, to me, this is a very broad, loosely coupled, generalized architecture that is highly extensible. And that means it's going to grow and become more and more powerful over time. We've already seen that in the last couple of years because this is relatively new and it's just getting more and more powerful. So that's why I'm excited about it. I'm excited to see what happens. It's really good. I think that some of it will um, probably get even easier to use because I think the Python SDK is great, but there's still a lot to keep track of. So maybe some of those things can be simplified. I'm not really worried that it will happen because Microsoft's strength has always been simplification and making difficult things easy to do. You know, democratizing AI and data science is certainly a key mission that Microsoft has, so I'm not really worried about that. So kind of reviewing where we've been, uh, or really not review so much as tips. 
allow yourself some time to learn this, play with it, look at the example notebooks, and it isn't, it, it's cool, but it does take a while to get your head around. If you program in Python, you know that you didn't learn Python in two days or a couple of hours or anything. It takes time. And this is a sophisticated service. Well worth learning, though, because it will it really turn around your projects. Your AI projects can be so much faster and have so much more reliability and benefits, etc. I, I mentioned this before, and I highly recommend it. One template you can start with is the one that I'm that I've uploaded. But have templates that are sort of like, you know, skeletons that you can plug and play. I like the idea of like what I did where I just kind of say, insert your code here, and then you put your code in and just keep separate. Like, okay, these are the sort of generic patterns that the Azure Machine Learning Service needs, and I can just tweak those pieces when I need them. And you could even put those into separate notebooks saying, run this piece to create my compute environment, and then I'll do this, etc. Explore it and have fun. I don't recommend customers ever start with a mission critical project on new technology with new things that they're just starting and some of these things are still in preview. First start learning. Don't use secure data, etc. Play with it. Get to learn how security features work, etc. And as you grow, pick a I really believe pick a small, useful, but not mission critical app to start with because you're going to learn and then those mistakes are less costly to you. And then once you have a good foundation and the people are skilled in what you need to do, then you can take on a more core mission critical kind of app. So as I said, start with something simple and considering just consider just using you know what you need. So let's talk about where we've been. We talked about understanding the Azure Machine Learning Service and we talked about the whole setup and the concepts involved in how it's a platform service and definitely I think nailed that point home. We looked at training a model using the AMLS service or AML service and how we need to kind of map all the pieces we're going to need so we can push it off and because it's going to be detached from us when we run it. So we talked about that. We looked at thinking about Azure Machine Learning Service and comparing it to Boston Pizza, which is great. And I, I kind of gave some advice on how I've learned the Azure Machine Learning Service. I'm continuing to learn. It's very big. It's very wide. And I'm excited to learn new things about it and get more into it. But I'll, I don't think I'll ever be a complete expert on something that has so much complexity. And that's okay. That's true of everything. Python is wide and deep. R is wide and deep. So uh, the important thing isn't that you know everything. The important thing is you know the things you need to know, that you can apply it, and that you know how to get more information to add the things you need in as you go. So thank you for watching this. Subscribe, like, share with your friends, and all that. And uh, until next time, if you have specific things you're interested in knowing about, let me know. If you think there's a, an area you'd really like uh, a presentation to focus on, my goal is to kind of step through a lot of the different areas, including the GUI, and have some fun with this as we go. So until next time, thank you.